Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst of Storage Switzerland. Joining me on the light board today is Brett Schechter. He is a technical lead with Dayterra. Brett, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, George. We're looking forward to this. Yeah, so, you know, as I talk to, let's say, Global 1000 uh, organizations with data centers, I, I'm seeing kind of five key requirements or, or at least needs within their uh, storage infrastructure. Uh, one of the big ones, of course, is hyperscale, the ability just to grow with the environment and keep up with uh, what's going on there. And I think closely coupled with that is also dealing with this constant change. I mean, you can't lock into a single uh, type of scaling. You've got to be able to have some flexibility there. I think another big one is, of course, availability. Uh, nowadays, you know, obviously, not only is downtime not an option, interruption's not an option, right? So you've got to be able to be just smooth and seamless as you work. Obviously, uh, performance is, an, is a continuous requirement and something that we just see people asking for more and more of. And then finally, just because we can't get enough people, right? I think the ability to automate operations becomes uh, super critical. Uh, just it's staffing just is just a real problem. The, the, we need to be able to empower IT generalists to be able to maintain these infrastructures. So Brett, how are you guys at Dayterra addressing these five key requirements? Yeah, so the good news is it's been a great year for SDS and for Dayterra specifically, and we actually have customers that fall into each of these categories. Okay. Let me take it from the left. So I'm going to take it from hyperscale. We have a global 1000. They began to purchase in a very small fashion for us. They were, weren't quite sure. They've got everything in their data centers across the world. They have uh, HCI, they've got traditional arrays. They weren't quite sure what workloads SDS would support okay. and what type of performance, even after a lengthy POC, they could expect. So their initial was six nodes. And for those of you that are new to Dayterra, the good news is these could be from any of multiple vendors. So, so I'm not locked into a particular server or configuration? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, you're not even locked into a generation of these servers. Okay. Fully heterogeneous, and in the case of this customer, they actually went for three NVMe nodes, so NVMe SSDs? Yes. Okay. That they needed for certain highly performant workloads. Another thing you can do is set up policies as you're scaling out. So you might have a portion of this giant namespace that is highly performant NVMe or Optane. Maybe you call that a platinum tier. You also have um, maybe hybrid disks here. In their case, these were... Um, I'm just going to say SSD, but they were actually SAS SSDs. We also support SATA. So a wide assortment of drive technologies, okay. giving you a lot of flexibility, and that's going to play into the next thing that we tackle, constant change. Now, well, and, and these two really go hand in hand, right? Because there, there are, I think, one of the challenges that we see in sort of the first generation or so of hyperscale architectures is you do lock into that node class, and the only way to change node uh, you know, node components is to go to another cluster altogether, right, where it may not be the case. Exactly, and in a prior life, I had to buy my equipment that way. It was very painful. Mm -hmm. uh, no, you may very well buy an initial cluster uh, and have it 10 years down the road as you continue to refresh, add in new technologies, new drive technologies. Cascade Lake just came out. Maybe you're adding in new CPU technologies. Sure. There's a lot of flexibility in the way that you scale. For this customer, they actually took this six node cluster and they began to scale it out up to about 20 nodes. Wow. At, at that point, not wanting to have all their eggs in one cluster, so to speak, mm -hmm. they began to buy 20 node pods from us and it has now become a fairly large deployment, uh, multi-petabyte deployment. Wow, okay, so that gives them the ability to sort of uh, uh, package this up and move it to different data centers and things like that. Yes, and in their case, and I'll talk about it when we get to availability, continuous availability, we, uh, we offer stretch clusters as well, and that's something they're beginning to deploy at present. So, Brett, as, as I kind of look at this, we talked about hardware change, but there's another part of this that changes frequently, I would assume, is the software itself that drives all this. How, do, how does software changes roll into this? Yeah, all the software changes, and I'm going to call this continuous availability here. Okay. All of the software changes are over the air, non-disruptive. 
when we talk continuous availability, it's not just in one substrate. It's just, it's not just number of replicas. We have customers who have been up 100% of the time for two to three years at this point, and they're very large customers. Okay. There's a lot of components to that. We offer one to five replicas. Those replicas, which we'll talk about in autonomous operations, can be living on a stretch cluster in a different DC. There are failure domains that we could set up so they could be on multiple racks within multiple failure domains. You're going to be protected in terms of availability. Uh, you also, every node that you add really increases the durability of the system. It's a shared nothing platform. So particularly for customers that have built very large nodes. Going back for a second to this hyperscale customer, they actually, because it plays in here, they actually began to build out, I mentioned the pods. So they started buying in racks. Okay. They started buying 20 node pods, filling entire racks. They began to set up, and they're in the process of creating stretch clusters, but they began to set up failure domains. They experienced something that I don't think anybody else, to my knowledge, even our closest competitor, can have happen. They had a two node failure. Okay. It's very rare sure. and we survive that. They remain at 100% continuous availability. It's somewhat unique to Daytera. We were pretty impressed with our system mm -hmm. and the architects actually did a little dance <laughs> after that. With that customer also, because one of, the, one of the most interesting things that happens in a data center when software defined goes in, the networking teams and the storage teams begin to get a little bit closer. Sure. And they actually had a, uh, an unplanned dual switch downtime. So top of rack switches right. that went down, cluster recovered, all of the clusters recovered with no impact whatsoever. That's good. Yeah. So I, I, and I think as the more we talk to these uh, larger, you know, uh, hundreds, thousands of server type of environments, which are becoming more commonplace, is this concept of rack survivability, right? So I'm assuming that continuous availability is part of that, that, that I can survive an entire rack failure now, right? Yes, and the other part of continuous availability in a prior life where I had to buy this gear and keep my fingers crossed as a large hosting provider that we, uh, we didn't get even, you know, six nines wasn't enough for us, you'd never migrate with this type of system. Uh, You're constantly refreshing the cluster, adding to it. Those migrations are very painful. They typically have either a performance impact on your end users and or some downtime. Yeah. You're, you're almost refreshing in place, for lack of a better word. I, I like that. Yeah. Can we use that in our literature? Sure, yeah, sure absolutely. Okay, thanks, uh, so the from a performance standpoint, you know, I, 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 obviously with the NVMe and the, the second tier being just SAS SSDs or SATA SSDs, that's a big thing. You mentioned Optane. What, what do we, I think one of the concerns I see a lot of times nowadays with uh, performance is I have to sacrifice something to get high performance. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, no, the, the architecture is brilliant. We actually have something called lockless coherency protocol, okay. which doesn't provide the internode locks that you might see for example, if these were traditional arrays and you had eight nodes in a single namespace, there's some latency added because of that. Sure. The, uh, the great secret sauce, again, is that lockless coherence. With Optane, you can actually create 107 microsecond or less stack, including the Daytera software, any of the iSCSI protocol, as well as uh, anything else the network might introduce. You know, Brett, one of the key things when we start talking about performance is, or at least what I see a lot of other vendors doing is sort of sacrificing features to be able to get that performance. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts there? Yeah, so this performance number, let me go ahead and put this in, with features. There are no compromises in the platform. So okay. for example, adaptive deduplication, very little, if any, performance impact at all, particularly on the right side because of N NVDIM, mm -hmm. little bit on read. So everything that you may have expected with your three and four letter legacy storage vendors, kind of stuff we've been buying for 15, 20 years, you're going to find it here. Encryption, data at rest encryption, dedupe, compression, very feature laden platform, and also there's a lot more to come. Okay. So, 
So that that works really well. The other thing I want to kind of uh, kind of circle back on is you had mentioned that that you guys sort of bring the network and storage teams uh, together. Uh, as a as a grizzled uh, storage veteran, and you had also mentioned iSCSI, uh, I, I get a little nervous when I start seeing performance and availability and all this with iSCSI. What kind of what kind of results are you seeing there? Yeah, we're, we actually that's, a, that's another great question. We've got customers that are fiber channel zealots, and you you know them. They love the stack. They've already invested, so uh, it's not even a cost issue for them. Right. They're testing iSCSI. Um, you know, with, uh, with a great keen eye on whether or not this will replace. They're seeing low latency, they're seeing high performance, they're running storage on 100 gig networks that have been in place for a while okay. for CPU and other applications. Okay. And then they realize how much simpler we support L2 and L3. Okay. And we even had one large customer make a switch on the fly from L2 to L3, much wow. against our best practices, but they did it very successfully. So again, big companies, maybe it's fiber channels end of the line, and with 200 gig um, ethernet on the near-term cost-effective horizon, that's not an issue for these customers. Yeah, I, I, in fairness, I think that ethernet is just gonna make up for anything just in raw performance, right? This eventually it just it just outperform everything on the market. So I think yep. that makes a lot of sense. So, I mean, I looked at this, you got, you got hyperscaling nails, you got the, you're dealing with change, which I think is pretty rare. You've got the availability stuff taken care of, you're giving me performance without me having to sacrifice features. I think one of the other big challenges, especially as I talk to these uh, global 1000 type of accounts, is I can't get enough people. Right, I, and and I I can't find I can't find storage specialists even in these accounts anymore. Right, or enough of them. there's the concept of a storage team is sort of this nice long ago thing. Right, so I think you know we have autonomous operations right there. I think the only way to get that is to automate the storage specialist. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that we've tried to do since the inception of the platform. So when our original founders were sitting around and theorizing what they wanted to fix. It's exactly what you just mentioned. We want to take human error out of the equation. We want to take people out of the aisles at major data centers right. so that all you see are servers straight down. And the AI and the ML that are built in are not bolt-ons. It's not just a, a technological add-on because those are the cool words. Right. The entire uh, cluster, when you initially set it up, it's policy-driven. So you set up storage classes, platinum, gold, silver, bronze. As you add additional nodes, maybe SSD, maybe hybrid with rotational media, definitely Optane and whatever comes next. Some of the vendors definitely have some improvements on the current Optane platform. Sure. All of that ripples through the system. So add nodes, system does an inventory. It says I've got this new high performance node. Maybe I'll move some of these platinum workloads off of NVMe onto the new Optane. That's all seamless data placement. It's all done autonomously. In a prior life, when I was deploying multi-petabyte systems, let's say it was about a decade ago, uh, we, uh, we really struggled with the complexity of doing that in an optimal fashion. We typically over-provisioned. That added a lot of cost, and it made it hard for us to monetize the cost back. These autonomous operations are also, they're heaven sent for Kubernetes deployments. So you set these policies, PVs and PVCs, mm -hmm. all are very quickly deployed with encryption on, encryption off, dedupe on, dedupe off. You set all of those policies and the system literally uh, does the work for you on the fly without any manual intervention. So when I bring a new node in, do I, do I tell the system, okay, this node is going to be part of uh, this uh, policy, or how does that work exactly? You, you could. You set your storage classes at the beginning. Okay. We actually do a, an inventory of these nodes as they're added. Gotcha. We know what the media is on board. You probably have a diamond storage class, which is Optane or NVMe. Mm -hmm. If these new nodes are in that category, automatically added. Oh, so that's so, even easier then. Yeah. Yes, it's very, very simple and, and self-inventory. So, in the customer example that you've been going through, uh, how many storage administrators do they employ to, to manage that? Yeah, no, another great question. I used to track a metric that decade ago. 
which was how many petabytes per admin. Right. This particular customer, I believe, has three admins, maybe two are full-time, one yeah. is part-time, that's now administering a multi-petabyte system. Wow. And now that procurement, which is much easier, the procurement guys is a large company, it's an old company, they've been around a long time. Procurement guys struggle with proprietary hardware selling legacy arrays. Now they're just buying servers from HP, Fujitsu, Dell, so this is simple. It's something they do all day long and they're able to respond very quickly when there's some change in the cluster that requires it. So, so what are the key takeaways for the, sort of the hero of the story then is your customer, right? So what are the key wins for them? It was a re reduction of costs, uh, saving time. What are the, some of the key things? I, I like the way you phrase that. If I had a point to one up here, I think the others are expected in a product at this, of this caliber and at this class. Constant change. We have customers, bless them, they have no idea what's coming a year from today. It might be a change of orchestrator models. Maybe they move from VM into containers. Whatever the change is, they don't have to wait and buy that in three to five year buying cycles the way I had to a decade ago. So this, this affords them the ability to really rapidly respond and it's interesting for sales guys as well. It, we have sales guys who carry quotas and so do our partners. Mm -hmm. They're not selling once every three to five years. Some, in some cases, they're selling once a month. They're having constant conversations with the customer, which is a very different way to purchase a product. So, so Brett, I, I think one of the big things I see that with this constant change or dealing with constant change is it also addresses sort of the other you know, $500 word I hear a lot is, is agility, right? This get, makes a very, very agile storage infrastructure, right? Yeah, it's not only agile, it's very easy to consume. You're buying commodity servers, you're able to add quickly to the cluster. You don't have to buy in certain groups of two or four, maybe, you know, symmetrical bricks. You can buy asymmetrically. And that drives a lot of cost out along with the autonomous operation. Which, which is another big cost savings, right? I mean, I mean that, that autonomous operation and the, the commodity hardware really drives costs out of this. Ab absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, Brett, thanks for joining us on the Lightboard today. Thank you, George. So, so there you have it. If you're looking for ways to really kind of deal with scale, be able to uh, also deal with the way that ch the environment changes over time, have continuous availability, address performance issues without giving up features, and also really simplify the environment and automate it. it. You know, Deterra really has a solid solution here and it's something really to look at. I'm George Crump, Lead Analyst with Storage Switzerland. Have a great day.